If you have a full-time career, how are you able to build a real estate portfolio on the side? Well, our guest today, Devon Kennard, wrote the book on that, and it's called The Real Estate Side Hustle. I'm Kathy Fedke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Devon Kennard is a former NFL star who played for the New York Giants and then finally the Arizona Cardinals. And somehow, during the nine years he played professionally, he also was able to invest in rental properties, syndications, and private lending. He also found the time to write two books, It All Adds Up, and now The Real Estate Side Hustle, published by Bigger Pockets. And Devon is with us here on The Real Wealth Show for a second time. Devon, welcome back. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be back on. Yeah, when you were here last, you were still playing actively in the NFL. I think at that time it was the Cardinals. Then you switched to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you were talking about the concerns you had that, you know, maybe at some point you'd get cut or your career would end like most football players before the age of 30 or, or so. What What is the average age that a football player kind of gets cut or yeah. ends their career? So the average NFL career is only three and a half years. So, you know, I was really fortunate to almost triple that. I played nine years, but um, I was very conscious of that my entire time in the NFL because, you know, while I while I knew I was a good player and I had opportunities and, and all of that, I knew it wasn't going to last forever. And I was kind of already uh, beginning with the end in mind of knowing that one day my career was going to end. Yeah. And, and so you were still playing when you were on, I don't know, a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you were, you were setting up a backup plan. And how has that turned out for you now that you're no longer, uh, you know, professional athlete? Uh, I can say it was the best thing that I ever did for myself, putting myself in position uh, financially. But more importantly, it, or I, I guess I should say just as importantly, it was having direction outside of the game of football. You know, you do something your entire life and then it's taken away from you. Or, you know, for me, I got to retire on my um by my decision, but even so, having that purpose, uh, I found it being really gratifying already having a plan to get into real estate and, you know, had a lot of investments going on, had business ideas that I wanted to pursue that I was really passionate about because I find there's a lot of people who, you know, they, they get done playing and they're in a position where they're like, well, what do I do now? So I feel really fortunate to have been in the financial position because of all of my investments throughout my career, but also to feel like I have purpose in, in a uh, you know, motivation to get up every day. And I feel just as inspired in, in real estate as I did playing football. So I, I don't take that lightly and I feel really grateful. Now, most of our, most of our listeners are not professional athletes. Uh, they don't end their career after three years, but a lot of your path is similar to, to people who have careers, you know, at some point, they end, right? And perhaps they have a plan in, in place for that or they don't. I mean, what kind of similarities do you see between you now that you've been really active in the real estate industry and educating so many other people and out with a new book <laughs> called Real Estate Side Hustle? Um, you know, how is your situation similar to other non-professional athletes that also have careers? I think it's actually more similar than people realize. It's just more in my face as a professional athlete when I played. Like, for instance, on our off days, they were bringing in guys to take my job every every off day. They, you know, they're trying to find faster, cheaper, stronger, faster uh, guys to replace me. But to be honest, I don't think it's any different in the workplace. So, you know, for all your listeners who are entrepreneurs, nine to five workers, career path. They're trying to replace you, too, with somebody younger, uh, cheaper, <laughs> better. Um, maybe it's AI. Maybe it's other technologies. But they're trying to replace you, too, and making people realize that to where, you know, make sure you have a plan and you're putting things in place to be financially secure and safe even without your nine to five job, because the ultimate goal, I think for everyone should be to be in a position be where you're working because you want to, not because you have to. I was, I had a career that I absolutely loved, but I didn't want to feel like my entire um, financial life was dependent on me playing one more year, one more year, because eventually that was going to dry up. And I think everyone else should have that same mindset. And even if you're doing it for the next 50 years, 
you're in a position, um, you know, way sooner to be like, oh, I'm doing this because I really like my job or I, I really want to do this, not because we need the paycheck to make sure that, you know, bills are covered, et cetera. So that mindset, I think everybody can embrace. I mean, that, that is real wealth. That is what we talk about is retire, retiring yourself from the things you don't want to do. But so many of us, um, you know, aren't, aren't wanting to go play golf every day. <laughs> even my, even my syndication partner, you know, Fred Bates, who we've done a lot of projects together at 15 now, uh, he, when I first met him, he was, he had been retired. He had retired twice. And he said, you know, there's only so much golf I could play. I was getting bored. So some of us just want to be able to continue to use our skills and to, um, you know, grow and, and learn, but the things that you want to do. Right. Absolutely. And I, I love that not being, um, not being forced to have a job or a career that just, just for the money just for the money. That that stinks. That's a horrible situation to be in. Yeah. And some people start out there, but the whole objective is to get to the point where that's not the case for you anymore because you're it changes the decisions you make. Like, And what I can say, even I could have tried to play one more year and I would have probably had opportunities. But what I found was the opportunities weren't worth it anymore. The um, I was getting presented with opportunities that were going to take me away from my family. I didn't think the pay was, was to the level that I deserved uh, considering the career that I had. And some guys are in that position and they're going to take whatever they can get. Oh, one more team wants me, I'm going to stretch it out. But my mindset was it had to be the right situation because I did take all the right steps to put myself in a good financial position to where I'm like, you know what? I don't want my last year to look like that. So I'm going to decide to retire here, even though I had opportunities. So, you know, I think that's a powerful position to put yourself in and, and everyone, you know, everyone listening can do the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I love what you said earlier is you never know when you're going to get cut or replaced, or like you said, just choose to leave because it's not, it's not healthy for you anymore whatever that environment is. So tell me about your new book, Real Estate Side Hustle. Uh, I, we have the same publisher, Bigger Pockets, and our books are both coming out uh, about a month apart. Ours is Scaling Smart. Which, so which, what, I'm, which uh, I'm listening yeah, to right me. now. You know, I do audio books, so I'm, I'm listening to, I love it. You guys did an incredible job. Thank you. Thank you. It was really fun. I didn't know how hard it would be. I didn't know if it would be too hard to write a book with my husband, you know, and uh, how we'd pull that off, but it actually was so seamless. I guess after 30 years together, we figured it out. <laughs> you you but, had yeah. the right systems okay. in place to knock it out. That's awesome. It was really fun. Yeah, we we wanted to make sure both of our voices were in there. And so we just separately took, I and mean, this is a great thing to do with your spouse on any topic, but definitely your dreams, your future is to both of you have a really um, clear voice on it. We just each had sticky notes and we separately in silence with well, music on wrote all the highlights of the, um, of the last 30 years of being in business together, all the breakthrough moments, the aha moments, the challenges that we overcame. And then we took all of what we wrote down on the sticky notes and put them together where they matched a little bit and they were in some kind of order and that became the chapters. So oh, it was, it was awesome. fun. <laughs> all right. So the real estate side hustle, what, first of all, why that title and the subtitles for passive investing strategies to build wealth beyond your day job? Yeah. And I, I think it's all about that. You know, for me, I um, embarked upon the challenge of figuring out, I felt like I was in a position. There's so many people out there who are like, um, passive investing isn't real. Um, you know, it's 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 not a thing. You have to be really in it. But I come from a perspective. I didn't have a choice um, whether I can invest actively or passively. It was either figure out a way to invest passively or don't invest at all. And for me, not investing at all wasn't a choice for all the reasons we've talked about thus far. So it was like, okay, how can I invest passively? And I essentially, through trial and error, a lot of podcasts, a lot of meetings, um, and a lot of research, figured out the four ways that I think any myself and anyone can invest passively. And over the years, I've built out 
you know, standard operating procedures and and a lot of pers uh, perspectives on how to do that um, in each category. So, you know, the four things I touch on is single family and smaller multifamily investing. And that's where real wealth comes in a lot. Um, and I talk about in the book of, of um, buying from turnkey providers. And then the next way is, you know, building a core for a team and investing on your own, but that takes a little more work and a lot of SOPs. So, you know, I talk about the difference between those two ways. You can do both passively, but turnkey providers is a much more passive way um, that takes less work. And then I talk about syndication investing and and being a limited partner and how to assess um, and, uh, you know, a good general partner and, and the uh, a couple of things to look out for in syndications. And then private lending was is the third vehicle that I discuss uh, heavily. I think you can do that very passively, either through a fund or on your own with the right SOPs. You can really lend on your own. And then the four is commercial real estate. And I kind of say that's kind of the big behemoth in the sense of you can do it passively, but you have to have a good amount of net worth and knowledge and skill, but specifically with like uh, triple net leases and buying commercial properties, uh, that can be another very passive vehicle that you can grow into. And all four strategies are, are things that I was able to get into throughout my throughout the last 10 years while I was playing. And during football season, I only had five hours or, or less uh, to concentrate on real estate. So, you know, I would steal hours here or there with like listening to music music while I was lifting weights and stuff like that. But for the most part, I was doing this off of five hours um, a week of concentrated art. Right, I'm going to lock in and focus on this. Uh, so, you know, I just had to really build out the the processes to be able to do that. And I kind of lay it all out in, in real estate side hustle. Yeah, that's what was so shocking to me when you when I interviewed you a couple of years ago and you were still, you know, playing professionally. Tell me about the life of a professional football player schedule wise. What does that look like? Yeah. So, I mean, in season, it's football season right now. So um, I, the guys are so busy. Uh, it's, it's pretty much you're waking up at probably 5.30 to 6 a.m. and you're not getting home until 6 or 7 p.m. because there's practice, meetings, more meetings, lunch, you got to lift weights. So a lot of people think we're just there for a few hours. We practice, maybe lift, watch a little film and leave. It's a full it's a full day thing. And we only have one true off day a week. So that off day was where I spent most of the five hours where I say I would really focus. I would do it at kind of midday. I would wake up early early, go work out and get any treatment I needed on my body to feel good. And then in the late morning, afternoon, I would kind of lock in and be like, all right, this is my real estate time. Um, but besides that, your days are packed. So, you know, you got one, one day to figure out extra time with your family, personal time. And then, um, you know, that day is typically Monday, the day after games, which is Sunday. So Sunday's game, Monday's off day, but you still got to fit, fit in everything else. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday are pretty much 6.30 a.m. to about 6 p.m. And then Saturday is travel day to where you got to go to practice and then pack pack your stuff and get ready to head to the flight for your game. So our schedule's intense and uh, you got to be intentional with your time if you want to make something happen. Totally intense. That's that's incredible. And and I bet there's people listening saying, yeah, that doesn't sound too different from my life. <laughs> you know, everyone is pretty busy. Uh, that's that's really intense. Uh, but I was so blown away at how much you knew about real estate, considering that was your schedule for what do you say, eight, nine years? Yeah, nine seasons. Yeah. So, so, yeah. And then all the training. Oh, yeah, that. Even in college, I was in college for five. So that's all I knew. Yeah. And so, so many people have excuses about why they can't invest and, and here you are. So in five hours a week, you know, and again, we're, we're looking at also, you've got, you've got a family, you've got two kids, you, you got married during that time. This is, you know, how do you, how do you possibly have time for your personal relationships and learning to invest? So 
I'll just start with how did you balance all of that? Well, I think the five hours a week was um, was really important to me because that was factoring in that my family, I got uh, two girls, you know, my wife. So that was really important to me, obviously. So that's why I, I kind of limited it to five hours a week in season, 10 hours a week out of season. And outside of that, I would steal some extra time learning by... If I'm in my car, I'm listening to a podcast. If, uh, you know, some people are working out with headphones, um, listening to music, pumping up, I'm like listening to Real Wealth uh, show on, uh, while I'm lifting, <laughs> literally. Like this morning, I was listening to your most recent episode. Um, so th like that's that's how I, I call it stealing time, but that's how I was able to steal time and learn and, and stuff like that is any kind of free time um, during season, it was a lot of airplanes and flights. So I was either sleeping if I wasn't sleeping, I was listening to podcasts, listen, reading um, or listening to books, um, always trying to learn and grow and then being able to focus those five hours with the knowledge that I've been gaining and be like, okay, I need to do this and constantly figuring out the, the right um, software to use that was going to help me. How am I going to track things? Um, how am I going to you know monitor creating a pipeline of deal flow to where I don't want to review a hundred deals. I need to, to um, look at only five. Like for instance, you know, your team in Dallas, they send me a couple of deals, not, I don't want their whole Rolodex of, you know, properties they have. Cause even now I know I'm not going to review 20 deals. Like let's help me create a buy box and let me see like three or four. Yeah. And, and then I'll act. Yeah, totally. So those are the kind of things that I started to like build into what I was doing to where it made it very impactful when I got to spend those five hours and not kind of everywhere with it. Yeah. Brilliant. So no excuses, people, you know, <laughs> now what, what some people might say is, well, yeah, but he was making a lot of money. So it's a little bit easier to invest when you have that much money. And yet you were surrounded by people who were also making that much money and not investing it because no matter how much you make, it's pretty easy to spend it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is majority of the people around me weren't doing what I was doing. So I don't think the money was the factor. And obviously everybody's situation and financial situation is a little different, but there's lending sources. There's, there's things you could take advantage of to still be able to invest. And, um, you know, well, no matter what your current financial situation is. So I kind of look at all those as excuses for me being, in the NFL, the big excuse is I'm too busy or who can I trust because, you know, everyone's trying to get, get get after my money. So I had that excuse. If you're someone who, you know, you, um, you didn't make as much money as I could have while I was playing in the NFL, it's like, oh, I don't have the money. Um, but there's going to be hurdles no matter what. And there's ways to to get around them and to still make good investments. And I think it's important regardless of your situation. It's just as important for me when I was in the NFL as it is for someone else with a nine to five job trying to buy their first property. So you mentioned hurdles. And of course, the first thing I thought of is just being, being in the game, right? Being on the field. What are some of the disciplines that you that got you to the NFL and had you be successful there that have helped you be successful in, in investing? I would say... The biggest thing I've been able to to lead to success, both football and uh, in real estate and investing, is I, I embrace delayed gratification, and um, I'm I'm strong enough to like kind of deny peer pressure. Like you know, growing up for me, it it was easy to kind of you know you're surrounded around people who are like, oh, let's just go party or let's just go hang out. And it's not that I didn't like those things and, and I didn't enjoy myself at times, but for me, it was more about, I got to handle my business first. So I was always a good student coming up because it's like, I, I was like, school was one of those things where if I do well and it, hopefully it puts me in a position to be successful. And then in football, it's like, I have to earn the weekend. So I, I got to get all my work in. I have big goals. I want to play in the NFL one day. So I can't do what everybody else is doing if I have a bigger goal than everybody else. So, you know, all my high school friends are going out and, and partying. I'm going to work, get two workouts in, and then maybe I'll catch up to you guys later. And, and that kind of mentality's mm -hmm. trickled over throughout my, you know, playing career from 
high school all the way to the NFL, but also business wise and and financial decisions. Like, you know, I um some people would be like, oh, don't buy fancy things. And I'm gonna be honest with you, there's certain things I like. Like, you know, I I kind of like a nice watch and I finally bought like my my dream car and things like that. So I come from the mindset of like, um, how you do it and when you do it matters. So it's not, I'm not going to tell anybody they can't go and buy the nice things that they like, but I rather invest it, earn it in, in other income streams and passive income streams, and then be able to buy those things. And that, that concept of delayed gratification has served me very well, you know, um, in football and in real estate. Yeah. I love that. There's trillions of dollars that's going to be inherited over the next decade. And people will be coming into to big money, and that that is just so important. I had to teach a young couple recently who was planning on spending all the money they were about to get. It's like, no, 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 invest that money and take the cash flow or the profits from that investment to spend. Yeah. Then you haven't then you haven't spent the money; it's still there. You're yeah. just getting. And the I profits. think that difference is is huge because some people you tell them no, and they're like, "I got all this money, and you think, and you're telling me I can't buy this." And it's like, it's not no; <laughs> just do it differently. Add one more step. Invest it first. Let that money grow. Let the income from that money come in, and then you know, start to um, look at buying some of those things you want. So it, it's it's like later instead of no goes up a long way in your real estate journey or investing really in general. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's talk about the first um, strategy that you have in your book, uh, Real Estate Side Hustle, which is, of course, our business, Turnkey Rentals. What are, what are some of the um, lessons you learned in that process? Uh, I think one of the biggest things is make sure there's going to be consistent deal flow from your turnkey provider. So first turnkey provider, this is long before I knew about real wealth and stuff. Um, I met a guy who was fixing flipping in um, Beach Grove, Indiana. So in Indianapolis. And, um, you know, I connected with them. He was great. I went out and visited, saw the properties, um, saw some of his work. And then his wife was... Um, started the, the property management. So I'm like, okay, it's pretty much in-house. This is a great opportunity. And I bought a property and that property turned out great for me. But the issue is he kind of ghosted me after one property. He had like an institutional mm -hmm. buyer who he connected with and started buying up all of his properties. And all of a sudden I went from like, oh, I'm going to scale and I'm going to get 10 to 20 units in Indiana. And I'm buying, I bought that property for 87,000 and um, with a partner and it was going to rent for like twelve fifty, or I did rent for twelve fifty. So the numbers were amazing on that deal, but I'm like, I can't, I can't scale because my, you know, the guy, you know, my turnkey provider disappeared. So that was one of my first lessons. Mm -hmm. Is like, you know, you gotta if you're gonna go the turnkey route, you gotta um, vet them out and make sure they're going to be able to give you a consistent pipeline of opportunities and not just a one off. Because especially if you're investing out of state, finding one deal for pretty much anyone is not going to do it. Like if you're trying to yeah. ha have goals. So that was one, one of the big lessons and then uh, holding them accountable throughout, throughout the process. So one thing I really appreciated with real wealth is the standards you make your, your turnkey providers in each, um, in each location, uh, you know, you make them abide by because all of them aren't treated equal. You got some turnkey providers that are putting make, uh, uh, make up on a pig on their renovations. And I've dealt with that um, with that before. And it's like, okay, it looks great. But a year in, I'm having a ton of issues because you guys didn't fix anything behind the walls. You just painted and and made it look a little nicer. So, um, you know, making sure that, okay, what, what's ha what are you guys actually doing to the properties you're renovating? If they're, you know, fixed and flips or, you know, um, who's the builder, if it's a new build, uh, like, are they doing quality work and, and things like that? And making sure the turnkey provider can also really describe the area and why it's on the path of growth or why it's a good investment because, you know, they could be selling you properties in areas where the growth is actually declining and they're just finding cheap mm -hmm. deals and, and selling it to you. So um, the whole business, if you're going to do into a turnkey, is really assessing the provider and, and their strategy, where they're buying, the team they have in place. And the, all that work is kind of done up front. And then it's just holding them accountable along the way. Oh, I love that. There are so many shysters out there. It's, it's 
pathetic. Mm -hmm. But what you just said, I, I've had people come to me and say, hey, we want to offload some properties uh, to your members. Like, no, we don't offload anything. We're looking to upload, like, yeah. <laughs> to, to bring people up. And uh, yeah, we, we've seen people just try to get rid of their worst properties by trying to sell them as quote unquote turnkey. And there's really been no definition of what turnkey is. That's why we tried to give it one, at least our real wealth definition of what needs to be replaced, what needs to be done. And, you know, we've worked with these teams sometimes 10, 15 years. So um, they're not going anywhere. But I, I, I love that insight. That's really helpful. What about on on some of those sort of off the radar properties that you bought in in markets that are maybe not growing as much, would you have done something different? Would would you have still invested in higher cash flow properties or higher growth properties? Looking back, uh, I mean, looking back, my perspective has changed a ton. So, like up until, if I'm completely honest, probably a year and a half ago, I would bang my fist on the table and tell you I'm a cash flow investor. I'm building my income <laughs> to a certain level. And my overall, my portfolio in these cash flow markets, the cash on cash returns been really well. I mean, I've averaged eight to 10% return. They've, they've chugged along. But what I've really seen is that's been the cherry on top. Even in these cash flow markets, uh, it, I've benefited more from appreciation and tax benefits than I have from the cash flow over that amount of time. And then on top of that, that cash flow has fluctuated and it, ha it hasn't turned out as great as I originally thought because along along the years, CapEx and R&M hits. And whether you have a $100,000 property or a $400,000 property, a roof Caught is a good amount of money, and it's a bigger chunk coming out of a hundred thousand dollar property as opposed to a four hundred. Like it, it doesn't decrease in in price to replace a roof that substantially. So if you only got you know five k in cash flow for that year on one property and a roof, you could wipe up the wipe out the whole year of cash flow in just one capex issue. So understanding that and seeing that over the years has kind of opened my eyes and made me realize that you know you really benefit from real estate investing through appreciation and the, the tax benefits along the way. And the cash flow is the cherry on top. Obviously, I don't invest in properties that aren't going to cash flow, at least some, but it's changed my perspective. And I'm actually looking and in investing in more appreciating markets because I'm like, if my best benefit is going to come from appreciation and, and tax why am I going to invest in cash flow markets instead of appreciation markets? Um, you know, the return I've gotten could be even better if I was in markets that were appreciating more. So that perspective is is impacting my future decisions a lot. It's so funny, isn't it? Yeah. It's like when I started, it was the same thing. I'm a cash flow investor. I learned from Robert Kiyosaki. This is what we're supposed to do. And he's not wrong. You know, I mean, cash flow is great. I I just think it's funny that I have properties in this little town called Newcastle, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, that was, we bought them because they were near, uh, you know, some oil drilling at the time. And it just, we just thought it was going to grow faster than it did. It really didn't grow at all. We were just looking at this property that we paid, I don't know, $55,000 for about 10 years ago. What do you think it's worth today? Not much more, <laughs> I would assume. It, it is about uh, about at least Zillow said fifty five thousand. So here we've just we've had this property, like you said, it's cash flowed great, like one of our better cash flow properties. But then I look at some of the other properties we have that we've had for ten years, where we made a hundred or two hundred, or in some cases three hundred thousand in appreciation. It just it just doesn't compare, especially with capex. And for those of you who don't know what that is, that's capital expenditures. That's just stuff that breaks, that always breaks over a period of time. Houses, you know, in some areas worse than others, and older homes particularly, they're going to have more issues. So, yep, yeah, we're I all think, we're I all think learning. That rings a really important point that I've been like chewing on, and I'd like to share. Um, I started yeah. thinking about the concept of really having a plan financially for fast and slow money, and buying real estate is more slow money, especially early on. Like you, if you leverage it up, maybe per unit you're bringing in two, three, four hundred dollars a month. You stack that up with multiple properties over the years, that 200 turns into four or six, but it's slower. You got to wait it out. You got to own the property for a while. But what some people struggle is they want to retire 
and um, you know they're planning on living off this rental income, but they haven't paid the house down enough for that rental income to really impact them. So you're going to have to wait five or ten years to where you know maybe it's paid off or or um, maybe the rents are are up a whole lot. So now you're cash flowing more, but in the meantime, you need to address faster money, especially if you're no longer working. So that was a dilemma I hit recently to where it's like. I have a portfolio. It's great. I think it's. I'm really proud of the portfolio I've built. But the, the cash flow from it's going to benefit me more in ten years than it is today. What is going to What's going to be my vehicle for faster income now that I'm out of the NFL and, and in retirement? And that's kind of why I started like my lending business because I'm like that's my cash cow. That's giving me a higher clip of income to then obviously sustain my lifestyle, but then also be able to reinvest in more properties. So I don't think a lot of people in the real estate space talk about that enough of like, if you don't have a nine to five or you you are um, as your fast money, you need to address that too, or you're going to quickly run out of capital and you're just kind of waiting for the properties to go up in value and waiting for rents to go up. And, you know, I think that's being, you know, you got to play a little offense too, in the sense of, I want to generate enough income so I can keep buying. Absolutely. I think there's this dream to a fire, right. Uh, to, um, to retire young. And, uh, and that's, that's a great dream. I, I think a lot of people would love to make enough money to go travel and do whatever they like. And yet we are really, uh, we're, we're designed to have a goal, you know, to, to accomplish something and to expand personally from that. So I, I agree with you. There should always be something that motivates, motivates us for that fast money, the money that we need now. And that's how we grow. When Rich, you know, was diagnosed with melanoma and told he had six months to live, I was like, oh my gosh, I got to figure out the fast money. Like you said, I never called it that, but I like that. And that forced me to go out and figure it out. And I ended up bringing in a sponsor who wrote me a big check um, for the Real Wealth Show back then, 20 years ago. And that sponsor ended up being a mortgage broker. I ended up designing all the content around him and mortgages. It was so successful. He's like, I can't handle the business. Come be, uh, you know, come work for me. Uh, so I became a mortgage broker and that's how I really figured out the power of leverage in, in real estate. So, you know, fast money for sure. It's yeah, like I mean, it's one of the if you look fastest at ways to grow. Any real estate investor who, you know, maybe doesn't have a job, the ones who have a job, their fast money is their nine to five, right? Like they're making income and then they're, mm -hmm. they're doing that. But like in your case, like real wealth and the businesses you've created is your fast money. And then you guys go and buy buy real estate and create and do syndications and stuff on your own. And that's your slow money that's going to like take care of you for forever. But when you start to look at it that way, it's like that's the real kind of formula. But people just talk about like fire and like live off of your rentals and you can down the line. But that's not something to like I'm going to buy three rentals today and live off of this 5,000. And then all of a sudden they have vacancy and they can't pay their own mortgage because they're, they're counting on that $5,000 or, or what have you. So um, I think that's the kind of, that's where my mindset has been shifting to where it's like, okay, you gotta, you gotta address both in some capacity. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, Devon, I would love to have you on. We'll have to have you back to talk about the other three uh, strategies. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but Thank you so much for being here with me again on The Real Wealth Show. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you would like to learn more about turnkey properties, how to buy rental properties with property management in place, just go to realwealthshow.com. When you're there, you'll also find out about our syndications. We are just launching our newest syndication, a build to rent community in San Antonio, Texas, launching this week. It's going to sell out quickly. So if you're interested, check it out at realwealthshow.com. I'm Kathy Fedke. Thanks for joining me here and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.